Red Rocks, how are we doing today? You guys good? You feel good? Hey, will you scoot in if you have some space? We got some people trying to find seats and don't sit down quite yet. Stay standing because I wanna say this to you, what I believe God wants you to know is he does not want you just to merely attend church today. The creator of the universe, his intentions for you today are to encounter him and come to know by experience just a little bit more the depths and the height and the width and the, the reach and the power that his love for you really is. Not just intellectually in a way that makes you smarter, but personally in a way that makes you more like Jesus. And so engage today and lean in and listen with more than just ears because his spirit is here and closer than the very oxygen that you are breathing in. If his love is an ocean, it's not an ocean for any of us to stand on the shore and observe and watch. It's here for you to dive straight into because I believe today God wants to break down the sacred secular divide in your life. Because to Jesus, everything is spiritual. And if you live most of your life outside of this church like it's secular, you will mistakenly begin to believe it doesn't mean anything to God. And you will spend your day changing diapers and running errands and cooking dinner and going to work and returning emails and leading employees, and you will start to think, does any of this really matter? When in reality, it's crazy how much it matters because God is in everything and his royal blood is coursing through your veins and he is writing you into his story of moving creation forward. I'm telling you, he's with you in church on Sunday. He's with you at work on Monday. He's with you at the club on Friday. And I just got a, I got a hunch that there might be a self-made dam in your life holding back this vast spiritual reservoir of calling and meaning away from everything that you would call secular. And today, Jesus wants to break that dam down and like a raging river, let purpose and eternal significance rush into every aspect and part and piece of your life if you'll let him. I want you to let him. The premise of today is this, and it'll be up on the screen. When you know God, you will know who you are. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. In other words, relationship reaffirms identity. Identity indicates calling. We're gonna call this message what it means to be human. So Jesus, teach us what it means to be human. Amen. Amen, guys, you may take a seat. Welcome to church. Welcome online if you're joining us. We're so glad that you're here. Guys, I had something stuck under my eyelid for six hours last night, um, couldn't sleep, got an hour of sleep and three cups of coffee this morning, so I'm not liable for anything. If I accidentally cuss today, just ignore it and let's just pretend, let's pretend some stuff doesn't happen today, okay? With that said, let's do some theology. If you have your Bibles, go to Genesis chapter one, page one. You guys ready for some theology? How about the rest of you? Are you guys ready too for some, okay. <laughs> All right, Genesis 1-1, back to the very beginning. If you don't have a Bible, we've got a jumbo sky Bible for your viewing pleasure right there. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering. I don't know what that was. Sometimes you need to go to a church where there's sound effects. <laughs> hovering over the waters. And God said, I wish I had James Earl Jones's Mufasa voice for this, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light and he called it good. So pause, God creates by speaking and he calls it good. That's important because Luke 6.45 says, from the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, you wanna know who you really are? Pay attention to the things you say. The first thing God wants us to know about his substance is revealed to us in the word he uses to describe the creation he just spoke into existence. And God could have picked any number of religious sounding words. He could have said it is holy, it is perfect, but the thing God wants you to know more than anything else is he is good. Continue in verse five, and then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. 
And then what you're gonna see is a pattern of God creating by saying, let there be. Let there be the stars and the sun and the moon and let there be day and night, let there be land, let there be sea, let there be plants, let there be animals. And then all of a sudden in verse 26, something just shifts and it goes from God saying, let there be to God saying, let us make. Now this is a classic writer's trick. The repetition is there for a reason, so the sudden change gets your attention and says, hey, listen, because this is the grand finale. All of that has been leading to this. Verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So we are the Salem Elohim, and that's the Hebrew word for image of God, and that's a big deal. Or should I say, you're a big deal. And you should have a deeply rooted respect for people because they, you, we are the Salem Elohim, we are cre the creator's representatives to creation, his co-heirs and kingdom partners. And, and, and the more you know God, the more you will know that. Because the more we know God, the more we know who we are. In other words, relationship reaffirms your identity. And then it goes on and says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, yes sir, God, be fruitful and increase in number, Fill the earth and subdue it. Skip ahead to 31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. In other words, God looks at you and says, nailed it. You gotta understand, he made galaxies and called them good. He made you and said, very good. Eden is echoing your true identity to you. And identity indicates calling because there is a direct connection and correlation between image of God, Salem Elohim, and rule over or have dominion. In the Hebrew, it's the word radah, and it's actually the language of royalty. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden to radah, to royally reign or have dominion over all of God's creation. So there's the answer to our timeless question, what does it mean to be human? The answer is found on page one of your Bible, broken into two parts. To be human means first and foremost, simply just to be God's masterpiece. And then it means to have dominion, to cultivate and create within creation. So you are loved for who you are and you are created to do. When you know who God is, you will know who you are. When you know who you are, you will know what to do. Relationship reaffirms identity and identity, identity confirms your calling. And if that's true, and if there's no such thing anymore as the sacred secular divide, and everything is spiritual, and everything matters to God, and through everything that we do, he's dragging the age to come into the present age, then my hope and prayer is that this message would give a lot more meaning and significance to your Excel spreadsheets tomorrow. That's my goal with this. So let's break it down into two parts. Number one, when you know God, you will know who you are. So 3,000 years ago in Bethlehem, there was a young man named David. You might recognize that name from stories like David and Goliath, David and Bathsheba, too soon maybe, I don't know. David was the youngest of all of his brothers, the least liked by his father, Jesse. David was a shepherd, so he spent all of his days as a kid uh, around more sheep than people. But it was in those mountains and in those pastures that David developed a deeper love for God than possibly any other person on the planet and earned his God-given nickname, Man After My Own Heart. And then the legendary prophet Samuel from First and Second Samuel, that guy, shows up at David's house one day and the Bible says when Samuel sees David, he goes, that man is tall, dark, and handsome. And I'm like, is this scripture or People Magazine? So Samuel, imagine Samuel is looking at Ryan and then 
Ryan sort of steps aside and behind him there's a tall, dark, and handsome guy, and that's David, <laughs> Nehemiah. And Samuel goes, that's my guy. And he anoints David right there in David's living room in front of all of his brothers as the future king of Israel. That's crazy, but to me what's crazier than that is David's next move. Because he doesn't go to the palace, David goes back to the pasture. Quick side note, if you don't know the next thing you're supposed to do, keep doing the last thing God told you to do. For David, that was being a shepherd. And then 1 Samuel 18, 14 says, in everything he did, David had great success because the Lord was with him. God was always with David, and the reason is because David was always with God. The more you know God, the more you will know who you are, which is why the greatest thing you can do for the people in your life is for you yourself to go and spend time with God. Not to know things about him always, but to know him. So in 2011, I, uh, I ran into Tim Tebow and talked to him for two minutes. I don't know if that makes us best friends. It certainly makes us friends. So let me tell you guys a few things about Timmy. I can, I can say that because you guys can't, but I, I'm his buddy. And I know, I know a lot of things about T, okay? Here's a few things about Tim. He was the quarterback, at, at, he was a Florida Gator, quarterback, won the Heisman Trophy in 2007, a two-time BCS national champion before he was drafted to the NFL, played for the New York Jets, played on the Denver Broncos, and on January 8th, 2012, he led the Broncos to a playoff victory over the Pittsburgh Steelers by throwing a perfect post-route touchdown pass to Demarius Thomas in the first play of overtime. I mean, it was art, it was beautiful, I'm so excited excited for football season, I'm getting distracted. All I'm saying is, I know a lot of things about Tim Tebow, okay? But here's the thing, if you run into Tim at lunch after church today, whatever you do, don't tell him Doug Weckenman said hi. <laughs> I mean, he'd be polite, and because he's the golden boy, so he'd probably say, oh yeah, tell him what's up. But he, he has no idea who I am, why? Because I know things about him, but I don't know him. So my question for you is this, do you know Jesus like I know Tim Tebow? Like you know some facts and some verses and can talk the talk and doing the game, but, but do you know the heart of God? To sum it up, are you, are you a friend of God or are you a fan? You wanna know who I know a little bit different than, I, than how I know Tim Tebow is my wife, Sam. Because before we got married, we did long distance dating for over a year, and when I say long, I mean the longest distance possible. I mean for a year, me, Ryan, and E were doing mission work on the other side of the world in countries where you had to walk for miles just to find the world's slowest Wi-Fi. So for a year, we didn't FaceTime, we didn't Skype, we just emailed and wrote letters to each other. That's it, it's like a rom-com. I wrote letters, I wrote her every day for a year, church. It wasn't over. It's still, you're like, Doug, stop with the, stop quoting the notebook. It's been quoted in here so many times. But this is not me trying to quote Ryan Gosling. I'm saying me, you guys. I wrote her every day for an entire year, which quick side note means you don't have to physically be able to see somebody in order to pursue them. Hello, and that's for free, okay? You just, you can just owe me for that, okay? <laughs> On our wedding day, Sam gave me this every email and letter printed out and bound into a book, right? And I gave her a bracelet. <laughs> but those are like, those are cool. <laughs> I'd pass this around, but I can't pass this around, you guys. You would not come back. Actually, you probably would, and you'd invite all your friends next week if you could read what was in here. Me and Tim don't have a Best Buds version of this, not yet. So here's the thing, I know things about my wife. I could give you her stats, she's five foot three and three quarters, blonde hair, blue eyes, born on St. Patty's Day, graduated from the University of Colorado with a creative writing degree, is in charge of all the campus operations for this whole church and is way out of my league. I can tell you things about her, but a lot of you know those same that, all, all, like, stuff about her. But because of this, we'll call this pursuit, we'll call this relationship, I don't just know things about her, I know her. So my question for you is, metaphorically speaking, do you and God have one of these? 
I mean, this would be just the summation of all of your, your time in the word of God, all the, the prayers you prayed, all the time you spent with him, the decisions you made with him, the life you invited him into, your time in community, your time at, at church, all of it with the end game of knowing God more. Because when you know who God is, you'll know who you are, and who you are is called and chosen and righteous and royal. And I just, I have this dream of seeing a generation of Christians that are hungry to know God, not just know stuff about him. And I am becoming increasingly unimpressed with people's Bible knowledge. I heard it said recently, we are, we're seeing more and more theological know-it-alls who actually don't know God at all. And I'm preaching to me, Okay. All of us, like, and I'm, a, I'm what you call a Bible nerd. I actually love that about myself. I'm a student at heart. I always will be. That's great. As long as you remember, following Jesus is not a knowledge contest. This isn't a competition to see who knows the most Psalms and Proverbs. This is not religion. It is relationship, and relationship is intimacy. Your soul is thirsty for God, not information about him. Not just to learn things, but to go and do them. Because we are the overtaught and underapplied generation of Christians. And we say stuff, and I say stuff like, hey, teach me, teach me deeper things. And that's good, that can be noble, but there's also a flip side of that that's teach me deeper things so, I can, so you can confuse me theologically so I can feel smart and feel like I'm doing something and I don't actually have to go love my neighbor. Give me the next emotional high or revelation from the next new book or podcast or, or conference. Enough with the milk. I want some meat. But when did the simple gospel of Jesus stop becoming the steak on your dinner plate? When did knowing the creator of the universe become the side dish to your, to your heated theological debates and arguments? And I love those conversations. And there's a place for them, they're important, and we are called to love God with our minds just as much as our hearts, but just remember, your greatest challenge and endeavor as a Christian is not your intellectual ascent. It's not your devotion or your discipline. Your greatest challenge of following Jesus is trying to figure out how to believe the most unbelievable and simple news of all time that our kids are being taught right now across the hall. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Getting that into your heart is the greatest endeavor of a Christian. We are, our culture is, is oversaturated with content, good content, but all the surplus of information is useful only as it converts and leads into a deeper relationship and intimacy with God. Because relationship reaffirms identity. It awakens you to the fact that you are the Salem Elohim. You are an image bearer. You are, to quote him, very good. You are invited into the story God's masterpiece, a product of his brilliance and creativity, loved for who you are, period. When you know God, you'll know who you are, amen? And we take it a step further and complete this. When you know who you are, you will know what to do. In other words, from identity flows action and calling. So because David knew who he was, whatever David did, he did with excellence before David was a king, he was a warrior who acted like a king. Before he was a warrior, he was a shepherd who acted like a warrior. His identity indicated his calling to be an excellent representative of an excellent God. This is Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whether you're eating or drinking or sleeping or, or working, do it with all your passion and excellence as if you are working for God and not for man. Remember, all the way back to the start of Genesis, the cultural mandate, this invitation God invites us into to make culture. The Bible opens up in Genesis with a garden. The Bible finishes in Revelation with a city which tells me the garden was, was never static, but rather dynamic. The garden was never a finished product, but rather the starting point of a project that you and I find ourselves in. God wanted more for Adam and Eve than Swiss Family Robinson life. 
And he placed people in Eden and said, make the rest of the world look like this. Start families, start communities, raise kids, start companies, build cities, make culture, partner with me in my kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Whatever you do, whether you're a king or a shepherd or anything in between, a president, a pilot, or a stay-at-home parent, you are called to royally and actively partner with God in taking creation forward, loved for who you are, but you are so made to do created to, to work the earth, if you will. And I mean that word work so much broader and bigger than the job you get paid to do. Like if you're, if you're raising kids, is that work? Oh my gosh, yes. You don't get paid for that, they charge you for that. Like you pay a lot of money to work that hard. <laughs> if you volunteer here in any capacity, is that work? Absolutely it is. And then on top of that, there's running errands and mowing your lawn and cleaning the house and landscaping and writing that book or that blog or painting or creating or cooking. This is work. And whether it's vocational or your daily to-do list or just your passion project, it is most of your life is defined by that word work. And stewardship as an image bearer means doing whatever God has given you to do in the image of an excellent God. Not for perfection, but because he's worth it. So David was a man after God's own heart, but that's not why he got promotions. David was excellent at what he did. So there's a story, it's kind of crazy. Before David was king, Saul was king. Saul was God's chosen and anointed, but long story short, he stopped doing stuff God's way, started doing things his way, the anointing left him and an evil spirit came and started tormenting him. He couldn't sleep. And so his officials had this idea to hire a palace musician to come play guitar for Saul anytime he was being tormented to cheer him up and make him feel better. And this is 1 Samuel 16, verses 16 and 17. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for somebody who can play the lyre or the guitar. He will play when the evil spirits from God come on you and you will feel so much better. And so Saul said to his servants, here's, this is key, find somebody who plays, what's that word? Well. Find somebody who plays well and bring him to me. And guess who they found? The future king, who did not see his time in the pasture as an off season, but rather as a time to be excellent at whatever he did, whether that was raising sheep or practicing his slingshot or playing the guitar. David did not get that job because he had a good heart, you guys. They needed a musician in the palace, and so they sent for the guy who was doing the last thing God told him to do really, really well. He did not get that job because he prayed for it. He got that job because he played for it. That's why he was elevated. Luck had absolutely nothing to do with this. You guys know who Odell Beckham Jr. is? That's my transition. In 2014, Odell Beckham Jr. made what a lot of football experts call the greatest catch in NFL history. Against the Cowboys, too, which just makes this so much better for me. Um, falling backwards, one-handed catch, both feet in, pass interference. I mean, at that point, it's just art. The day after that happened, one of my friends texted me, did you see Odell's lucky catch? Let me tell you, that was not a lucky catch. Because you can go look up footage of Odell in practice and warming up before even that very game, making about 100 one-hand catches. Lucky catch, sometimes what looks like luck from the outside looking in is just years of, of working hard at a skill. What seems like God's blessing on somebody else's life is actually just them working at being really excellent at whatever they're, they're putting their hands to. Calling that a random happenstance belittles the process. Sometimes blessing from your point of view in somebody else's life only looks lucky. You think David killing Goliath on his very first shot was luck? 
absolutely it was, it was the farthest thing from it because when he was in the pasture day and night, just like the guitar, he practiced his slingshot over and over, hundreds of stones, thousands of stones, until eventually he could tell every single stone exactly where to go and what to do until eventually he killed a sheep and a lion, or he killed a lion and a bear just to protect some sheep. It's like David seemed to know, it's what I do as a shepherd today that will determine the kind of king I will be tomorrow. Like Jesus said, those who are faithful with a few will be given more. It was not luck that, that killed Goliath, you guys. It was years of treating every job and every battle and every pasture and every moment before the moment like this is the big time and this is the big moment because there will come a day where I'm gonna have to do this for real and when that moment comes, I can't flinch. David was excellent at what he did. And I'm telling you, there has never been a time where it is easier, you guys, to stand out as an employee than it is right now. In 2022, employers are having to convince employees to do the jobs they get paid to do. In recent history, I'm telling like right now, never been more opportunities to step up as a leader and to stand out with excellence, wherever you are. Like this is the moment, this is the season, this is the time that you've been waiting for. Remember the scene at the end of Pirates of the Caribbean where Will Turner's madly in love with Elizabeth Swan and so he commandeers a ship and crosses the ocean as the ultimate hero who saves her and rescues her from the zombie pirates and finally comes face to face with her uh, to confess his love and kiss her and he says nothing and does nothing. And then Jack Sparrow comes up and says, if you were waiting for the opportune moment, that was it. And then walks away. I feel like that's what God wanted me to say today. If you're waiting for the opportune moment to finally start living like the woman of God you know deep down you're created to be, if you're waiting for the opportune season to step up and act like the man of God you know the world needs, your family or future family needs that you were created to be, this is that opportune moment. This is that opportune season. These are the moments before the moment and it matters what we, if you're waiting for the promotion, if you're waiting for the job that finally has something to do with your degree that you got, if you're waiting to be completely healed from everything with no more baggage before you start walking and living this thing out like you're called, I'm telling you, God is saying today is the day of excellence. There's no place like the present. There's no time like the now. This is the opportune moment and season. Because I don't know about you, but you guys, I am just so, I'm, I'm tired of the word Christian being synonymous with the word average in the world's eyes. I'm so, I'm just so, like what if Christians were known as being excellent with work? As baristas, if we made excellent lattes, like the best lattes in the world. And as, as architects and engineers, we built excellent bridges and buildings. And as sandwich artists at Subway, we, we made excellent footlong sweet onion chicken teriyaki sandwiches toasted on honey wheat with extra provolone cheese. Like what if as, as nurses and doctors and first responders, we were known for our excellent bedside manner. And as financial planners, we strengthen families by getting them out of, by getting them financial freedom and teaching them how to be excellent stewards of God's money. I mean, you guys, if God is the source of all creativity and and everything that is good in this world and universe. And if he is the God who cannot be exaggerated, and if he created us in his excellent image to go and make the world beautiful, then the things we do, the work we do, the stuff we make and create should show him off. It should show him off. It should show the world who our God is. Like we talked about last week, we do not have a, a evacuation theology where God is just gonna hit the reset button and blow this whole thing up and, and start this whole thing over anyways. We're not killing time on this planet, rearranging chairs on a sinking Titanic. We're not. And because of that, we're not just making heaven more crowded, we're making earth more whole in the meantime. Because I'm telling you, a day will come, might be this day, where Jesus comes back and through a process called refinement, Notice, not total destruction, but refinement by fire of all things that are ungodly. 
where the new heavens and the new earth will be here once and for all. And I'm telling you, there's so much mystery to it and his ways and thoughts are higher than ours, 100%. And one day we'll see in full, for now we only see in part. But even today, I am telling you, some way and somehow what we do now matters deeply. The things we make and build that resemble heaven, the things we do that make the secular more sacred, from building a church to the apps that we code that bring people together to law enforcement and, and government and medicine and education to the families we start, the communities we build, the kids we raise, the prayers you pray, the money that you give, the time that you serve, the conversations that you have, all of it that has anything to do or resembles slightly heaven is gonna work. Your fingerprints are gonna be all over eternity. What I'm trying to say is it deeply matters what you do now. This is what it means to be human. The image of the invisible God. You're made in the image of a creative creator to creatively create. God is the designer of moments. And we are, like many Christ is what Christians mean. We go and we do likewise create within creation, cultivate, rearrange the raw material of, of God's creation in a way that is beneficial and helpful and drags the age, of, age to come into the present age and makes your sphere, your workplace, your church, your apartment complex, your family, your gym, your grocery store look a little bit more like heaven because your fingerprints are on it and because you are there. This is our calling and it matters and it begins with an excellent spirit. I just see visions of a world where Christians are are the best teachers and the, the best influencers and the best filmmakers and news reporters and the best athletes and the best moms and dads and the best husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and friends and employees. The world should know who the Christians are, not just by what we believe or what we say or what we post, but by what we do and how well we do what we do because an excellent God deserves excellence and we make him beautiful to the world through the way we royally reign and rule over his creation in the here and now, and it matters. And one thing we say here all the time is no normal Sundays, but if this is true, then it means no normal Mondays through Saturdays either. And he's with you tomorrow at work. He's with you Tuesday afternoon on your lunch break. He's with you Wednesday around the dinner table with your family. He's with you Friday. He's with you Saturday. And all the spaces and places in between, the sacred secular divide was destroyed 2,000 years ago when that curtain was ripped in half and the presence of God came here. And now we are simply making the secular more and more sacred by who we are and what we do. His kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Will you guys stand? When you know God, you will know who you are. And when you know who you are, you will know what to do. Relationship reaffirms identity. Identity indicates calling. Everything we end up doing in this world, if it's going to be fruitful, if it's going to be eternal, if it's going to outlive us, then it all starts from the beginning and simply just knowing him. And so as we sing, that's my, that's my sincere prayer is that you would encounter this God who wants to be experienced, this God who wants relationship with you, this God who is here for you to, to know, not just know about, but to know. And that news is so good that we have a God who actually wants to be known. I just believe he wants to speak to you. I believe he wants to give some people um, new dreams and new callings. I believe he wants to reawaken some that maybe died years ago. I believe he wants to take what you know or you've had an inkling, this is, this is what I'm made for and just, and, 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 and dry some wet cement and just say, this is it. This, I, I made you for this. So steward the moments before the moment and treat this week like the big time is right now. I'm not waiting for the future. We're not waiting for the palace when we got the pasture today because this is where beautiful things happen. The, the pasture is where David wrote all the Psalms 
that have been handed down through history that to this day are healing bomb for billions of people and broken hearts who want to know God. Like that's where that happened. That's where he got that nickname, the man after God's own heart. That's where relationship started. And so if that's where you are, then amazing. Be there today. Know God today. Let's sing to him and worship him today. So Jesus, we love you. And could we just know you more? I don't even, like, and God, you know what every individual person needs. And so I pray that you would help every person beneath the sound of this prayer know you more. Meet them how they need to be met. Speak to them what you wanna say to them. We wanna know you more so that we can know who we are reaffirm in people's hearts that they are your masterpiece, that they are a product of your brilliance, that they are image bearers, and that it's a big deal, and that they were created as your kingdom heirs and kingdom partners to, to reign with the king and co-create with the creator of everything. Pray we'd walk out of here in awe of how big a deal that is awaken something on the inside of us to that as we sing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.